Hey there. My name is Niyama Ashong, and I am really, really pleased to, to come and speak with you. Today, I have a story for you, and it's a story unlike any other story you've ever heard, because it's my story. It's a story like any other story, unlike any other story that I've ever told, because I don't know if I've really, really told my story out there. This weekend, I had an experience at the Rich Lippin Intensive and then with the high level mastermind of 4PC that has significantly altered the course of my life. I came there one person and I literally left a completely different person. But here goes the thing. I'm now more me than I've been in 19 years. And so what I wanna do now is really own that own who I am. My name is Niyama Ashang. For the last 19 years, I've gone by a nickname of Nemo Ashang. And now Nemo has served this part. And it's time for me to transcend and include. And as I do this year, I am reminded of my mission, which is to bring together a truly inclusive and empowered world. And I see and I talk to people and I work with people. And one of the most common things that I say is be more you. Be more you. How, how is it that we often teach what we most need to learn? And it occurred to me this, this weekend through the power of 4PC and through the energy and tension that was created that I haven't been owning all of who I am. I am Niyama Ashang. And it's really, really quite fun to say that. And I'd like to share with you my story. If you have any questions, let me know. It will only help me out. And, well, let's not stall any further. Here I am. My story begins several decades ago. I was born Ni Kwekuama Ashong on July 23rd, 1986 at Albert Einstein Hospital in New York City. I was born as, I'm the first generation out of Ghana, West Africa. And shortly after my first few years, we went to go and live in the city of, or the town of Pensalkin, which was, just on like I, I didn't realize this until quite recently, but it was really on the other side of the railroad tracks from Camden, New Jersey, which at the time of me growing up was the fifth most dangerous city in America. I had a great childhood, um, and my parents my parents made it made it happen for me. You know, they commuted a long way to work every day. And they gave me a couple of guidelines, some guiding principles to help me be able to navigate myself in the world, especially without them there. And one of the things that I remember very clearly from my childhood was the feeling that I wasn't like everyone else around me. You see, where I grew up, my, my, I just distinctly remember my parents saying to me, Niyama, you're not like the kids out on the street here. You're, you may look black, but you're not. You're African. You know, you, are, you know your history. You know exactly where you came from. You, have, you can trace your entire lineage back through our family. And so culturally, your history is different than those that you see around you. All right, that made sense to me. So if this wasn't the case, then um, even though I looked like the people around me, I guess I wasn't the same. So I started looking at people who weren't like me and I started seeing things on, on TV, this image of TGIF on ABC growing up. And we all used to just come in and watch Family Matters and Step by Step, uh, all those TV shows, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, um, just allowing ourselves to just come together as a family and all sit behind the TV or the VCR if it was recorded and watch these TV shows. And I would see how different people were behaving 
<laughs> I just have this distinct memory in my mind. My dad leaning over one day and saying, Niyama, don't go doing what you see on TV. We are not like those people you see on TV. This will not happen in our house. And the message I received from that there, um, that was like, I'm also not like the people I see on TV. I'm not like the other examples out there. And that was actually really interesting to, to have both of those dichotomies within me, to be the first generation out of Africa living in America in an area where I'm surrounded by people who look like me, but who aren't like me. And, I'm, and I also have a lot of people who don't look like me and who also aren't like me. My, when I was six years old, six or seven years old, I was in um, first grade and I ended up taking an exam to get into uh, the gifted and talented test. All I remember is that my teacher at the time, Mrs. Pistrito, uh, she introduced me to a man in a white shirt and a red tie. And it's like, this guy's just gonna go talk to you. Uh, I didn't know what the exam was for. I didn't know what the purpose of it was, but what ended up transpiring was that in the very next year, I stopped going to the elementary school that all the people around me were at. And instead, I was transferred to a new elementary school. Now, this elementary school was more in like the heart of the town. And when I got there, it's really interesting because it's, it's present for me now in this moment. And as, as a child, I wonder how much it was really there, but I can, I can feel it. I can feel the truth in it. I got there um, and I entered into this, into the gifted program. And at that point, that was when I really started to start, first start to feel the areas of where I'm different. And I realized that when I looked around at my peers, I was the only black guy in, in that program for the next two years. Uh, and then there was one more person. And then I think in several, like I think like four years later, there was another black person to join us. So it was, it was a while, right? And one of the things that I realized fairly quickly was that I wasn't going to fit in. And I don't know, I'm really grateful. I'm so, so grateful for like seven-year-old Niyama for choosing this way. But because I felt like I couldn't fit in, I made a decision to fit out. So I ended up being the class clown. Uh, and I took it even further from just making jokes. I was just like allowing myself to be all up in my weirdness. Uh, I just have, I have this memory of uh, putting glue on my face and uh, making it be like, letting it dry and then being like, I have a beard like Santa Claus and just being able to do that in the middle of, of school. Uh, I was the guy who would walk around with uh, socks on top of my trousers. I'm like, this is cool now. We're going to now put our socks on top of our trousers. Trust me, it's the, it's the way to go. Um, I was also the, the, the kid who in eighth grade would stop entire assemblies with all the rest of the school, three grades in there, and jump out into the middle of the auditorium and do this thing that I called a strut. And maybe one day you'll get a chance to see it. It's really fun. It just involves me strutting uh, for quite a bit. But I was, I was great at it. I was great at fitting out. And that was me. Niyama was making his, his impact, playing in, the, in band, was in the jazz band. I, had, I was making a great life as Niyama and really just being different throughout it. I'm calling the story the life, death, and rebirth of Niyama Shang. I really feel like that like captures a lot of the life there. There's so much more about, you know, this, I can, and as I'm talking about this here, I'm just seeing like family, family events and all these other things that help make Niyama Niyama. But I feel like where we need to go now is into really like, yeah, let's, let's go into it. The death of, the death of Niyama Shang. It all, that all started and began in like 2000. Uh, I had entered high school and I was playing the alto saxophone in the Penn Salkin marching band. And I remember getting there and introducing myself and saying, hey, my name's Niyama. And very quickly, everyone's like, oh, we're going to give you a killer nickname. Like Niyama cool, but we're going to give you a killer nickname. 
And I'll be honest, as someone who's fit out for so long, the idea of getting a nickname was awesome. People knew me enough, they cared about me enough to go out there and give me like a name on the side, a name that was theirs, a name that like, that to me said, I belong to you and you belong to me. And like, you, you get me. And so you've, you love me enough to give me something different. And so they started experimenting. Um, <laughs> I'm going through this list in my mind right now. Uh, it was, a, it was a pretty interesting period of time. I went through a number of different nicknames. Uh, I was Good Burger from Keenan and Kel and, uh, and Snick, all that. I was, they tried out Noxzema, Nantucket, Duracell, like all these names that were just like, let's just, let's just see if this will, if this will work. And we did it in the way that kids do. It was, it was really fun. But there came a time where I started getting two nicknames that actually just wouldn't fly. A group of people called me Black Guy as my nickname, and that was it. Just like Black Guy. And another group of people called me Special Dark Chocolate, SDC. And both of those names really, I'll be honest, Black Guy was like a clear line in the sand. I want to say that I was powerful and intent and all that enough to say Special Dark Chocolate. Special, I can't even say it right now. Ooh, special dark chocolate was something that I came and said, absolutely not. No way. You can't call me that. I let it happen. Um, special dark chocolate was reframed as SDC and black eye. Well, that one, that one, I was like, actually, no, that's not going to fly. But I realized that this process of finding a nickname was, a little, was much more tumultuous than I expected it to be. And one day, as uh, as I tend to do, I showed up late to something and um, our section leader at the time came up and he brought up some reference to Nemo. And this is Nemo Adventures in Dreamland, a French cartoon of some boy who falls asleep and travels the world on his, with his blankie in bed. Um, and his name was Nemo. And I remember the feeling that I got when I heard it. When I heard it, I was just like, yeah, this is super neutral. Like this is a name that I can like just carry and just like be with everyone. You see, when I got this name, it was what, 2001 maybe? Finding Nemo wasn't even on the horizon for us. Like I was just Nemo. And it was just a name that was actually allowed me to just be like everyone else, to be accepted and to have my, my spot. And so I started playing. I started creating uh, a life for myself as Nemo. In for in high school, for 15 years earlier, they had known me as they had known me as Niyama, and I started bringing in Nemo into the mix. I can actually there was a long time I can tell where like if you really knew me, you would know me as Niyama. And Nemo had there's one there's one memory that that comes to mind that I really feel is, is like kind of defines the tension of. Nemo and Niyama, because my parents named me Niyama, right? Even though my birth certificate said Nikwe Kuama, they're like, yes, that's what your birth certificate says, but your name is Niyama. It's this wonderful combination here. You see, the Ni is a prefix given to males, which stands for basically a master or mister, depending on how old you are. Ama is a generational name that's given to the firstborn of every other generate firstborn male of every other generation. So if my name is Ama, there's another list of uh, names within my within the tribe that my mother's from, it's the God tribe, that has um, a different set of names afterwards. So my children will be named from that separate list. And then their children will come back to the list that I'm on. So, so it ends up going back and forth in that way. So in that, that case, I was named after my grandfather who was a firstborn, firstborn uh, male as well. And then Kweku, Kweku is a day name. It's a day name, uh, which means that I was born on a Wednesday and that I'm destined for fame and fortune. That part never left me, that second part never left me. So I have this rich name and my parents could not understand why I was trying to go by Nemo. 
And there's this, <laughs> there's this memory. We're walking, we're in Cherry Hill at this time um, and going to a Chinese buffet. And I'm walking with my dad, walking toward the Chinese buffet. I can see it clearly in my mind right now. It's the middle of the afternoon. And as I'm going into the buffet, two of my best friends from, from Marching Band, uh, Dave and Josh, come up. And they're like, Nemo, what's up, Nemo? Hey, Nemo, what's going on? And I'm sitting there beaming. I'm like, yeah, what's up? Like, we're out in the world. We just cross each other. And like, you know me, you know? And I just hear this voice that comes by. My, the way my friends tell it, I'll tell it from their point of view. We're looking at Nemo. <laughs> and his dad just lets it out. And he's like, his name is not Nemo. It is Niyama. And it like reverberated throughout the parking lot and bounced off of the, the store and buffets around us and hit every single car. My friends were just like, Mufasa? <laughs> it still puts a smile on my face when I think about it. But yeah, there was tension. There was tension in being Niyama and being Nemo. And I was good with it though. I was good with it. I had my, had my place and like I could be recognized out in the world as Niyama and as Nemo. And this continued on. Uh, and I had my own misadventures along the way until that fateful day when Finding Nemo came out in theaters. I remember that quite, quite certainly because so actually the first date I ever went on was a date to go and watch uh, Finding Nemo. And people will come up, do you know there's a movie with your name in it? You know there's a movie with your name in it? You know. I joke that I watched it uh, 10 times for the first time. But in reality, I watched it one time with one person on and something that like, even as I talk about it right now, my heart warms up to think about that, that first date I ever had was to a movie that, that, that had my name. And it was fantastic. I mean, if I, if, if I had created something for myself up until that point, it only went to the next level when the movie came out. Thank you, Disney Pixar, for making something that is, you know, a person, a, a fish, a personality that was just lovable, friendly, adventurous, you know, all the things, all the things that I felt that I was, you know, I really felt that I really feel served by, by that name Nemo. So thank you for that. Well, that continued onwards. And I think, um, there's something in here that I want to just, just kind of call out because in, the, in, in this transition period, I had also figured out something. I was in the middle of a social studies class one day and someone, we got our test scores back and someone looked at, my, looked at his score and then turned around and looked the score on my, on my desk. Now, in my head, this is what transpired. It was probably something a whole lot tamer, but in my head, he grabs, he rips, the sheet off of my desk and he starts waving the, the results up in the air and making, and then just proclaims to the world, I can't believe it. Niyama, I know that you didn't work hard at this. I worked so hard and you got a much better grade than me. Ah, and he slams the back of my desk and he turns back forward. What probably happened was that he turned back, looked at the score at my desk, said something to me and only me, but I could see the hurt in his eyes. I could see, I could see that, that he, I could see the pain that he was in. And what I took from that is that when I'm successful, I make, I hurt other people. When I'm successful, I make others feel pain. And if they feel that, then they won't want to be around me. And so I, I decided to change up. Like, I, I really feel like that was the day where I was like, it's okay. I don't need to be successful. And so for the remainder parts of my high school years, I was good. I was pretty good at like coasting and making sure, making sure I never got into too much trouble grade wise. Um, and if I did, I, I, I flipped that back around there. That's a story for another day. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think back to that. And I, I really feel like that was the day I made a decision to just, just get by and make sure that I never really stuck out that much because my number one fear was being alone. I've wanted, the thing is this, I didn't feel any different than anyone else. I never, I still to this day don't feel different. 
It's the reason why I can do what I do because I know that I'm just like every other person out there. I'm just doing things differently. And the idea of sticking out or standing out because of success and losing people in my life, like that, that I can feel it even in this moment right now, it rips me apart. And it's something that I'm working on. I've been working on for 15 plus years. So I did what I needed to, to, to get by and to not, not be too great. And it takes me to this one moment in my life when the big red book arrived. You see, it turns out that Cornell University had somehow found out about me and they sent a, they sent a pamphlet for me to apply. I never heard of the place up until that moment. My trajectory, my plan, my vision was to go and play the trombone at the College of New Jersey. I was playing in the jazz band. I had just learned the trombone. I'd gone from sax to tuba to trombone. And that's where I saw my path going. Well, I'm fortunate enough that my parents created an opportunity for me to like really just focus in, make the application and send it in. And I got in. I remember feeling really excited about it. I remember seeing like when, when the results came out, I guess it was May of 2004. And when the results came out, I clicked, I went to my computer, uh, I clicked on the link uh, to see what, what the results would be. And there was just like sailboats and people laughing and snow and like hilltops and this wonderful lake. And it's like, congratulations, you got in. I, I, uh, it was absolutely magical. And around that time, people started figuring out where, where they were going to go to college. And I remember sitting, I was like 17 years old at this time. I remember sitting in um, an English class. And it was our senior year. The, 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 we knew where we were going to school. Like the learnings for the year were done. Our grades didn't matter at that point. And our English teacher was like, you just spend time with each other because you're never going to have this ever again, ever again. So we were sitting in a group of like four people, four people pods. And... I was sitting in my group doing whatever I was doing. And somehow I just heard in the pod next to me, someone say these words. Can you believe that out of all of us, Niyama's the one that got into an Ivy League school? Can you believe that? <sighs> That's usually where I'm taking a break right now just to let that wash over me and just be in that right now because I think the, the reality of it is that I knew that was true. Who like I hadn't done work for at least two or three years, not like active work. I'd never, I'd never even heard of the school. I I was a guy who didn't even know that I didn't like not knowing what I didn't know was like just me. I took AP Calc and I didn't know you had to take an AP test to actually get credit for it. So I never took it. You know, uh, I'm the, like, yeah, there are all these other people who are working far harder and actually wanted to go here. They had aspirations of this year. Who was I? I was the guy that I was just, who literally in my high school yearbook, it says, you know, um, <laughs> I have friends that were like, Nemo, you need to stop striving for mediocrity. It was the thing that I said. I had to like strive for mediocrity. And just go for it because you have it. And so when I heard that, when I heard that sentence, can you believe that out of all of us, Niyama is the one? I realized something. I realized that what they were saying is true. Niyama really didn't belong in that group there. I also realized that, yeah, I, like I didn't belong there, but somehow I had gotten in. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be at Cornell, but somehow I had gotten in. And the thought process was as long as I got in, as long as I get that diploma, that's all that matters. So if Niyama's not supposed to be there, it's time for Nemo to shine. I really do believe that it was like in that moment that the death of Nemo really became complete. And when I got to when I got to Cornell in 
late in I guess fall of 2004, it was Nemo all the way. I joined my acapella group Last Call as Nemo. I joined my fraternity as Nemo. I went through the streets of Ithaca as Nemo. I was Nemo and it felt great. It was awesome. I like I was a guy who I'm not I like I just these are the things that just make me so happy about Nemo. Uh I knew like one, in, there was a one in 13 chance that I knew someone uh, in the group. What does that mean? Uh, out of all the people, how do I want to say this? I was really well known back in, back in school. Um, and that was what I wanted. I focused my first two years on just meeting people. I had an unlimited meal plan. And I went back and forth and just kept swiping and got a chance to meet people there. Um, I was weird and wacky and willing to do, do the fun stuff. And that was me. It was wonderful. <sighs> yeah, I really, I really got a lot out of out of being Nemo, and I learned I learned how to be Nemo. And it's it's really interesting because there's just there's so many stories around my college years that are that are in my mind, and I'm trying to figure out how many of them serve toward like the life and death of, of Niyama and Shang because there's so many. I, I'm a man that's full of stories. I think. I think part of what I started to experience there was just how quickly Nemo was able to connect people, connect me with people. Again, my number one fear is being alone. And so when I would describe myself as Nemo and introduce myself as Nemo, there was a, something that went on. I could see it in their heads. Like they were just connected, like, like the fish, like the movie. I've been saying that, like, I've been saying my name is Nemo, like the fish since 2004. It's been 15 grand years of, of saying that. And it was an instant connection. In high school, I was on the homecoming court. I have a, I have a memory of our band teacher saying, like, Niyama, I, I just don't get it. You are the only person I know who can be in the marching band, the jazz band, the AV club, the physics club. You know, at AV, I was doing morning announcements. Yeah, that guy. Uh, the chess club, you know, like... You're you're in all these different different groups and clubs which are not primarily popular, and yet you still made homecoming court. And then as Nemo in college, I ended up winning some other things that were in a similar line. Um, and it was just really great. I feel what's coming to me around Nemo in particular, because I think you're getting the sense of like this is like this this is where I came to life. You know, um, there's so many different stories around it because like every part of that was was Nemo there. Um, but what's what's sticking out to me is something around one of the program houses that was there. And there was a program house called Ujima. And a program house is a place where you can choose to uh, go and live if you volunteer outside. It's like a it's like a dorm, but with a specific theme versus just people coming together um, and being assigned. So this theme was Ujima, and it was basically known as like, it was like, oh, this is the black residential hall, you know? Um, and I remember someone coming up to me and saying like, hey, Nemo, like, I guess I'll see you later. Like, do, like you live in Uj, right? Like, I'm like, no, why would I live in Uj? Why would I live in Ujima? Because in my mind, I was like, this is one of my first adult decisions, and I'm not gonna go ahead and self-segregate. I need to learn how to be successful as me amongst the world where I won't be in a group of people who look like me. I remember that, like, I don't know how many times it happened. I, I just remember that one time that I said, it, I was like, I'm not gonna self segregate. I have to learn how to be successful in the world like this. And Nemo took it on. Nemo took it on. I ended up graduating Cornell with a degree in economics. I had come in as a math major and, and made a decision to move into economics. And I got a, a job working at one of the top consultant firms on the planet in this niche field as an actuary. And uh, as an actuary, one of the things that you do, the, the role of an actuary is to look up into the future and take on predicting the current day costs of future uncertainty and risk. 
um, risk is opportunity was uh, the name of this, uh, was the motto of the Society of Actuaries. And what I used to say is I help people put a price on risk. And so Nemo came into, into that job and into that world of New York City and just kind of exploded on from there. I really am like in this moment here, just like finding that all like during this, this time period, there was just more and more of Nemo choosing to find out more about himself in that regard and just living off from there. There was no elements, the elements of it that, that feel relevant, especially in the story of the life, death and rebirth of Niyama Shang uh, is this one memory, um, a couple of different things. I, I feel like I feel like this is where I felt like the struggle of being of my name, and I struggle of my name like within the system, a system that just couldn't handle my name, right? I have my birth name, Nikwe Kuama. I go by, I was going by the name of Niyama. That was like my official name. That's the one that I use on official documents. Uh, and then Nemo was a name that I was that I was going by uh, on a day to day basis. I went to get my driver's license in New York City, and I they saw my birth certificate and it had the hyphen in it, and they're like well, we need to put in exactly what your name is. I'm like, great, it's Niyama. They're like, no, we have to use exactly what's in your, your birth certificate. And they're like, but we're not allowed to put in hyphens. So from now on, your first name is Ni and your middle name is Kweku because we can't do we can't do hyphens. It's still to this day, just like, it baffles me. Cause I'm like, if you're not gonna use my name, then what's the point? What's, if we're, like, I, I'm still confused. I'm like, they're like, we can't give you the name that you have. Ah. I'm gonna let it go, <laughs> but but not really. I'm still just really confused about that, right? So I have that taking place. And then on top of that, I have my, uh, I was, as I said, I was studying to be an actuary and I was taking actuarial exams. And every four to six months, I was taking a different actuarial exam. And just so you know, the path to becoming credentialed as an actuary is somewhere between four to 10 years, four to 10 years, if you ever get credentialed at all. You're doing this while working, and, and unlike like being a lawyer or a doctor where you go off to school, you're working a full-time job, living a full life, and then trying to figure out how you're going to study on top of it. I'm doing this in New York City as a young 20-something with a bunch of my friends from the fraternity and just like you know taking the, the city by storm. And I'm studying 300 to 400 hours per hour of exam. Sorry, let me rephrase that. 300 to 400 hours per exam that I took. So there was a day that I went to go and take uh, taking the exam and I get up there and they see my driver's license and it says Ni comma K because, you know, my first name couldn't be there. I had registered with my, the official name that I use, which is Niyama. Uh, and there was just all this confusion that was taking place. And essentially at eight o'clock in the morning, I remember I walked in with my friend Luke to take this exam and I was prepared. I was ready for it. This was, mm, this was the time to pass it. I spent about 45 minutes going back and forth with the exam center and going back and forth with the uh, society to just allow me to take the exam, allow me to take it. Cause I don't have any documents that would say me Kweku on it. I don't have any documents that would say me. This one person at the DMV one time is like, <laughs> calls all this, <laughs> cause all this stuff that to take place. And, you know, I, I got to the point where they allowed me to take the exam. I said to them, look, here goes the thing. I've been studying for this for months, for months. This is my time. I am ready for this. Let me take the exam. And if you like, if we need to come back and figure this out, let me do that after I've already passed your test. I got something to take care of. And they were kind enough or well enough to let me go and just take the exam. I passed with an eight. It was awesome. Eight out of 10. I was, I was, I was like, man, and this happened on a day where I was flustered beforehand. Ah, good day. Good day overall. Annoying, <laughs> but good day overall. I'll take, I'll take the pass. That's worth it. So yeah, I think that that was me in, that was me all throughout really the next 10 years. I spent 10 years in, in New York city and moved out to Singapore after my wife, Nicole, created an opportunity for herself here. She's a boss, so like, that's just, that's just what she does. She's just awesome like that. So uh, 
you know, I was working at a tech company at that time and really feeling the bliss of, of being in that space. Ironically, uh, <laughs> ironically, uh, one, of the, one of the memories I have at working at that company was someone coming up to me. It was a, a black woman came up to me and she said, I'll see you at the happy hour later. I'm like, what happy hour? She's like, you know, the Black Alliance, I'll see you there. And I, was, and I just felt this thing inside me, oh, hell no. Like, I am not going to put myself, I'm, again, the self-segregation comes up. I am not going to be put into a box. And look, let's be real. Like, I just don't think I wanted to be seen as a Black male. I didn't want people to, to associate and attribute all the stories that they have around being a Black male here. From the time that I was born, when my parents said, you are not like those people on the street right next to you. You don't walk around with your... Like, like it just, I just couldn't be like, I just couldn't be associated with it. I was like, nope, you will not see me there. I won't be there. Ironically, my, the scope of my job evolved such that I went off to go and support the diversity and inclusion leaders uh, within the organization with their various affinity, affinity groups and some of the initiatives that were taking place in diversity and inclusion throughout the organization worldwide. Um, and so this thing that I was running away from I actually came and just like came smack on and hit me smack on uh, in the face. Wow, I didn't realize this, but this is actually a really important part of the story. It's actually really important. Because up until this time in my life, I've been going by, I've been Nemo for at least 10 years or something like that, more than that. And I guess this time frame is around 2016. And what most people don't know about me is that I didn't become black until I was 30 years old. Up until that point, I was operating quote unquote as Nemo and Nemo was the friendly, jovial person that you know fit into the society that, that allowed him to be successful. I have to say this here, and part of the life, death and rebirth of Niyama Shang is the fact that as an actuary, it turns out that only two to 3% of all actuaries were African-American at the time that I was practicing. And then I was in tech. And this is 2000 and what, 15 and 16, all right? At that time, two to 3% of all people in tech were African-American. In New York City, I love, I find those things that like, that are really challenging. I love playing at the top of my, at the top of my game with like people who are really going for it. And I joined a barbershop chorus because the bass part wasn't like my acapella group. I could sing whole lines and it was challenging and it was, and there was a way that we all had to integrate. There was harmony both, of, both with, your, with yourself, with others and with the sound. And in the barbershop world, I, like I was definitely less than two to 3% of all people Less than two to three percent of all people in barbershop were African American, people of color in general. And I remember this. I remember this day. It was during Black History Month, and the the Black Alliance had gone forth and organized a viewing during Black History Month, and the the viewing was of a movie called White Like Me. And uh, I can feel, I can feel, I can feel embarrassment. I can feel some shame coming up here. So I'm going to have to put it out there. The movie was, about, was, was designed and created for, uh, to speak about systemic institutional oppression that was occurring to black people throughout like the origins of the U S and specifically within like the last hundred years that was really designed from uh, the perspective of a white person to be able to talk to other white people. And the shame and embarrassment and guilt that I have around this year, it's like, it was in that movie at that period that I was finally able to see the systemic and institutionalized oppression that was all around me. It was in that moment that like, and I, I guess the reason I feel that way, why do I feel, feel that? The reason I feel that way is because I think it like reality, I think I just identified more as a white guy than as a black guy. And it's, it's not lost on me that it took that movie or it took a movie like that for it to reach me. When my parents were saying you're a lot like everyone else, I was like, just watch, you know, just watch and see, you know, my, oh, there's so much here. Oh, wow. There's a lot here to explore, even like in relationships, you know, my, uh, 
you know, I'm first generation out of Africa. Would have expected there was the expectation that I would find a nice black girl, a nice African woman to settle down with. And I was like, it's not gonna happen. And having to having to know that and fight for that every like all along the way and to be one of the first people to my family to marry outside of our race. And like, yeah, there's a lot there. There's that's more stories to come. More stories to come for sure. But I watched this movie and why like me and it finally hit me about the systemic and institutionalized oppression in the US and I was 30 years old and all of a sudden that it was just a few weeks earlier that I had been invited into a conversation where I found out that there are only two two to three percent of all actuaries were African American. I knew that the stats in tech uh it was the, the world that I was playing in but I think just the proximity of that and watching this movie, it just hit me. It hit me so hard. It was like, hold on, Nemo, you're really not supposed to be here. Like, not only is it, it's not like a lottery that came out, but like the game is rigged against you. And somehow you are consistently able to make it into places where you're not supposed to be. The game has been set up such that you won't be successful. And that was the part that I think was really, it was just really eye-opening for me and, and hard to, hard to just let it go by because I'd seen that it wasn't equal for everyone. And yet somehow I was playing the game and winning. You see, at that moment, I realized that like the two to 3%, I was living it. And gosh, the guilt that comes along with that, the guilt from a guy who, in 10th grade decided I didn't want to be successful because I was going to push other people away. The guilt from the guy who at his core felt no different from any other person there and took on a name that would allow, that was neutral. I was reminded this weekend that Nemo means nameless. Nemo in Latin means no one. It was the perfect name for me. The perfect name. And here I am, here I am. And somehow I've been, I'm in this, two to three percent club and I felt no different than anyone else who was I to do this the other 97 and 98 percent of black people out there who worked hard at this who wanted it who were pushing against their own boundaries or were being stifled in different ways like I didn't deserve it any more than any one of them and I knew it I knew it. I knew it. I'm fortunate enough that my wife introduced me to a youth leadership program called Hero Brian Youth Leadership. It's called Hobie. And one of the primary questions in the Hobie world is, now that you know all this, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with this knowledge that you've gotten? And in realizing, I can just feel, I can feel the weight right now, even in this moment, the weight of being one of the two to 3% of all people in an industry that are African-American. It's like, what am I doing with this here? Like, and what have I been doing that's different because I don't feel any different? That's, that should not be the case. What is going on? And I think in that moment, like it was a time where I realized, especially given all the other things I had, like I've finally gotten involved in diversity and inclusion. I was seeing the evidence. I was hearing the stories. I was seeing what other people were experiencing and I was feeling more connected to them. And at the same time, just more confused because I was just being me. That's it. And that's where like, the realization came like, wait, Nemo, you've always just been Nemo. Like maybe that's it. The fact that I haven't been playing the, I haven't been playing games of like, you know, I'm black, I'm not I'm like, this is me. And like, this is where I belong. I made a job, I made a co whole career change after eight years of uh, six years of working as an actuary and eight years of like working toward actuarial exams. I dropped all of that and made a, made a career change in two months to go from being an actuary to working in learning and development at a tech company. 
And I remember saying, saying to them, uh, I was interviewed by, by the head of people at the time. And he's like, he's like, Nima, I don't understand. Like, like you're an actuary and now you're in this, this field, like, like what was going on there? Like, how, how are you making this jump? And I said to him, I'm like, well, I think you're misunderstanding. I've my whole life. I have been creating community. I've been doing learning development. I do this everywhere I go. I just want to be paid for it. And I'm really, really curious about what happens if I can focus on it full time. There's a something about what I was doing and who I was being that was different from others. And what I really felt at the core of it all was that I was just being me. So we, so that's, a few months later, we ended up moving to uh, to Singapore, and in Singapore, Singapore was Singapore. I'd come in, and I was I was ready to just be me, let the world, let Singapore know what like Nemo had to offer. And I hit a wall of just loneliness. I was not in the first two weeks. I found out that like you know, like I'm a person who's very affable, wants to get to know you and all that. And that wasn't the way that it worked here culturally. And I was told that right as soon as I got there. I, um, yeah, I started to, I guess I, I guess at the end of the day, being out here is, can help me confront myself. There's no groups that I'm a part of that I can just like get into. They're different cultures. And it's like, it's like, you know, you're saying my number one fear is being alone. I got a chance to experience that. I'm lucky that I get a chance to be alone by myself and alone with my wife, Nicole, like together, we also get to be alone, but there are some really exposing things that, that take place from there. And I think it was during this time I was out here in Singapore and I started moving more and more and more into uh, really enjoyment. Uh, and really allowing myself to say like, wait, it's about the joy and about being yourself and really like leaning further and further into me and really under trying to see like, wait a minute, what if I didn't have to be this white version of Nemo? What if I didn't have to be a version of Nemo that like everyone already knows? And the, the, the question that was behind it all is like, well, then who am I really? Cause I know who I, I know who I have to be to be in the two to 3% club. I'm really curious if that's really me or if that's just something I've taken on to, to be able to exist in this world. A lot of times people ask me like, like, who are you and what you do? I'm like, I am Nemo Shang, period, point blank. I just want to be, because it takes a lot of work to have to just be and exist in this world as, as me. And that's what the last two years have really been. And I'm really grateful for Singapore for giving me this kind of like, non-stimulus environment, a place where I have to go out and create and see and really get a chance to touch in with what's real for me. I've been going back and forth. I've been flying back from Singapore to California every four to six months to go into um, the community of Rich Lipfin because it gives me a chance to explore myself. I'm able to explore other emotions versus the happy, the happy guy. And what I really say is the happy black guy or the angry black guy and being able to do the angry black guy in a place where I, I can feel safe. Because quite frankly, I learned from, and this is the thing, it, like, I think I had known from a very long time where after watching that movie, it was like, and seeing what was happening in America with violence going on and you know the people who are supposed to protect you being the ones that would actually shoot and kill you it became really apparent to me that if i'm angry people feel unsafe and if they feel unsafe they might call the cops and if they call the cops i might die and that death could be especially in america and in so many different ways, like actually just two that come to mind. One is the physical death. Like they actually physically just shoot you. And like, I just think about it all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, they would not have known. In my mind, in my mind, I'm like, if I ever get pulled over by a cop, like I'm like, I went to Cornell. I worked at Deloitte. Like, I, like can I, like, would that even matter? Or will I be seen as this black guy and my life be over because someone else didn't do the work? didn't do the work, meaning that they didn't take the time to get to know me. They didn't take the time to get to know me. Not even like 
the rest of the, of, of, of the community, but just me even. Or my life could end because I would be sent to jail. And that would be the death of my life. All because one person felt unsafe. It is really hard. Like I'm a master at making people feel safe. A number of people who come up to me and say like, within minutes, they're like, I just, there's just something about you that makes me feel like I can just share this with you. I know how to create safety around me because I've needed it. It's part of, a, it's part of the tools in which I've needed to be able to survive in this world. And so on the journey of the life, death, and rebirth of Niyama Shang, I found myself exploring more and realizing that I had been going by, I've been walking around life with this kind of title. Was, my name was Niyama, quote unquote, Nemo Ashang. And it was a time, I guess about a year ago, I'm not necessarily sure when, but it was a day where I was like, you know what? No, I am Nemo. And I went on and I dropped Niyama from like, I wiped him from the face of the earth. No social media handles, gone from my email, Niyama was gone. The quotes came off and it was no longer Nemo the nickname, it is Nemo. A few months after that, I was at a, at a convention and realized that for, like I was going that honestly, the creativity, the mission that I'm on, the things that I'm going to do, like finding a company name or something that would, that would be able to hold that was just like, it was really limiting. And they came to the conclusion that there was only one and only name out there that would be able to really hold the power of all of who I am and what I bring to life so that I can go out there and be, use my two to three percentness for the power of others to really do something with it. And so I decided to, to make it my name. And some of you might've seen that. There was a day where everything just happened. It was like, boom, Nemo Shang. Nemo Shang.com, Nemo Shang with the graphics, just Nemo Shang, boom, here, I'm out here. And I, that feels like the, like the real, like just full death of Niyama. That's where I've been playing from. You know, for the last 15 plus years, I've been Nemo Ashang. And it's been great. And it's had a tremendous amount of rewards for me. And then last weekend happened. Went back to California for a Rich Lifting Intensive. And I'm also a part of his high level mastermind called 4PC. And there was the perfect confluence of events. Being in this mastermind is one of the best decisions that I've ever made because it is full of a group of powerful people who are determined to hold their own power and help you remain powerful as well. It's a place that I really get a chance to explore and play with being angry. I really, it's, and it's something that has been really, really beneficial for me to be able to know that you know, for my mission, for my movement, for world joy and beyond. Like, it can't just be like all the range of emotions should be allowed. And to be play, to be, have a place where I can play with the most dangerous one for me has just been priceless. And this weekend during conversation, anger showed up again. I can feel myself feeling misunderstood. And I told a story. I told the story of 17-year-old Nemo in the middle of Inga's class hearing, can you believe that out of all of us, Niyama is the one who got into an Ivy League school? And I was really served that day because the person next to me, she reflected on some other areas, but she said to me, she's like, Niyama, you were born with such a beautiful and powerful name. And instead you're going by Nemo. Nemo means nameless. In Latin, it means no one. 
you were born with such the gift of such a powerful name and you aren't using it. I just want to call that out. Shortly afterwards, directly afterwards, I was served by an amazing, amazing gentleman full of heart, body, and soul, and more. And he shared with me his truth. And it was the lesson that I needed to hear. And in it, for me, was the level of confusion, the abstraction, the level of unclearness that you, the abstraction that you use when you talk to people is just you apologizing. Nemo, you don't need to apologize for who you are. You are a big, black, bold, and beautiful man. And that makes us feel safe around you. You don't need to make us feel safe. And when you're trying to come off as creamy or smooth and just plain old white, we feel unsafe because we miss you. We feel safer with you being you. I'm going right back there right now. I can, I can tell it's still, I'm, I'm grateful for it. I think it's part of the reason why I wanted to come out here and just share my story in this moment because it's still so real for me. Years later, when I collect the Nobel Peace Prize and I share this story, it may not be as close, but I really want to document my journey along the way because it's not easy. When he said that, when he said, it's not your job to make us feel safe, I just felt like this huge prism, like glass, just like shatter all around me. And I just like, I felt like, like my inner child, my soul needed to hear that. Needed to hear that it's not my job to make other people safe. Needed to hear that I no longer have to work at making other people safe. Needed to hear that it's okay to be exactly who I am. And in being who I am, I'm not working against the safety that I have to create, but I'm actually working towards it. People can feel more safe with Nemo as Nemo. People can feel more safe with me as me. It was a thing that I didn't know that I needed to hear. You'll see me, I'll talk about loneliness. I'll talk about belonging, but at the end of it, it's, it's fear that's at the end of it. That's at the, the core of it all and the feeling of safety. And it's very, un, I have felt for the longest time that it's very unsafe to be me. I've gone up to people and I, when I, when I work with them or when I try and get work done on me, I'm like, I see myself playing at the levels of Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. I see Colin Kaepernick and like that's Emma Gonzalez. Like those are the people in my mind. And this thought that if I'm really me, I, I could die. I could really die. And there's something that happened in that conversation. And it was just the energy of the room. I'll be honest, I was speechless. I tried in my head. I was trying, I was like, I don't know how to be this, but like, that's all I, and I wanted to tell him, I wanted to say, hey, I don't know how to do what you're asking. But my body just couldn't do it. My nervous system was just, and this big, black, bold, beautiful man, was brought to tears and cried in his arms. I walked over and gave him a hug. I didn't speak for an hour. Maybe it was only 15 minutes, but for me, it was like, I was, I was there. I was just with me. And as I was writing notes and kind of collecting my thoughts, I wrote down on a sheet of paper, Niyama Shah, Niyama Shah. 
Niyama Shang, Niyama Shang, Niyama Shang, Niyama Shang. I am Niyama Shang. And just really just reconnected with this part of me that I've held in exile for 15 years. It dawns on me as I'm sharing this story that I'm afraid of the death. I was afraid of the death of me. What like it could kill me. And I hadn't even realized that I had killed myself. So six, six hours later, when I was finally able to get my voice back or whatever it was, I stood up to that group of people. I let them know who I was. And that going forward, Nemo had served his purpose, but I am Niyama Shang. And that's how I show up for you today and every day going forward. I want to thank Nemo here. Nemo, you don't have to go away, but you've done your part. You have kept me safe. You've allowed me to be the friendly, positive, joyful person that everyone around me can just like immediately latch onto. You've let me walk into rooms where I really didn't know if I would belong and just utter your name, Nemo, like the fish and take people to immediately feel welcome, to feel attracted, and to feel connected with me. Nemo, you've given me a chance to play in so many ways, from being Ivy Man, to being Distraction Man, to leading movements, to just creating businesses. And being a really loving husband to an amazing, amazing woman. Nemo, I am so grateful for you. Your work here is done. I got it from here. So yeah, allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Niyama Kweku Ashang. I am, I'm everything. I am, period. That's it. Like, <laughs> I am. This is my story. This is who I am. This is what drives me. And I realized that as I keep going on and I work on living out Whatever mission was and purpose came into me from the standpoint of knowing that I'm the, in the two to three percent club and doing something with it and creating more space so that more people can come out there and let and be able to do it as me, not as a version of me that is acceptable, but as me, the one and only Niyama Ashang. And to create space for other people to be themselves so that they don't have to acquiesce, whether they know it or not. They don't have to conform, whether they know it or not. And so we all have more space to just be and exist in the world. That is why I am here. It dawned on me after I made this, this transition. And look, here's the thing. This happened on Monday afternoon, U.S. time. So this was like, yeah, Monday afternoon, U.S. time just days ago and after 15 years of only being Nemo when this this sequence of events took place it took one hour for me to know with every cell in my body I could feel it being rearranged as I was in that speechless sense or state it took me one hour to know with every cell in my body that I am Nemo Ama going forward. I thought it'd be something that I would have to intellectualize or to com combat against myself, but it is. But it was so complete. And I love my group of 4PC. The rest of the day, they just called me Niyama. They're still they're reaching out, they're sending love. And it gave me a chance to play in that safe space as me again. We had um, a theme there, so I was dressed up for the evening. And I went back to my hotel. I was staying at the Guild Hotel. 
And I specifically named that the Guild Hotel in San Diego because it's a part of my story too. You see, that evening, I come dressed up in, in the theme of, of the night. The theme was dreams. So I was wearing pajamas, uh, wearing two sets of pajamas simultaneously, actually, and a large book bag on my back. And I know from all the work that I've been doing over the last few years to be more and more of myself, that it takes practice to really own who you are, to really own those shifts, as opposed to just seeing glimpses of it. And so I wanted to do as much as I can while the momentum and the energy was high to actually solidify it. So I walked in the door with two sets of pajamas and a large book bag on. And I walk up to the front desk and I say, hi, how are you? What's your name? And she responds back, my name's Liadris. I was like, oh, very nice. Hi, my name is Niyama Shang. And she looks at me and she says, wow, what a beautiful name. <sighs> I haven't heard that like that in, I mean, in, like, I'll say in ages, but I'm like, I can tell you in 15 years. And so in the spirit of remaining, in the spirit of depth and honesty and really playing into this, I told her, I said, you know, I've only been Niyama again for the last six hours. For like the last 15 years or so, I've been Nemo. And you're the first person out in the world, outside of my community, who I've really addressed myself to as Niyama. I remember I got the feels all in that moment right there when, when <sighs> this being seen that way. Yeah, what a beautiful name. And God, the universe, spirit, whatever it is, let me know that this is exactly the path I should be on. Because the next words out of her mouth, I could see her eyes were glistening a bit. And she was kind of like searching, like looking at me, like searching a bit. And she's like, I just changed my name to Leodri's 10 days ago. And before that, I was going by a nickname that I carried since I was the age of five. To think that after 33 years of being on this earth, within six hours of me choosing to be me again, I can walk up to someone and share that little bit of my story and have it immediately connect with the next person. This just, just, just like, of course, this is what you need to do. I woke up the next morning to go and catch my flight. And I met a gentleman down at the front desk again. And I asked him his name and he introduced himself as Sequoia. And I was like, oh, that's a really great name. I'm Niyama. Pleasure to meet you. He's like, Niyama, what a beautiful name. And I told him, wow. Honestly, I could see it in that moment. I was like, Nemo, just like Niyama, just like leave, just, just go, like, let it be. Like, you don't need to go and tell him the story. I was like, ah, I'm going to tell the story. So I told him, well, it's only been the last 24 hours that I've been Niyama. And he said, oh yeah, man, I get it. Last year was when I decided that I was going to go back and allow myself to be called Sequoia. Up until then, I've been known as Q to my friends, everyone, just Q this, Q that. But there's power in our names. And I'm taking it back. And it's great to be here. It's a pleasure to meet you, Niyama. And it's a pleasure to meet you too, Sequoia. As I wrap up my story, because I mean this is this all this happened just the last few few days, a few other few thoughts came to mind. One is, was of President Obama. And the thought in my mind was, I like, if all the same actions were done by this person and he chose to go by Barry Obama, would that have anywhere near the level of impact as his true name of Barack? Mm. So as I sit here and I like, I think it's just part of what just made this transition so complete for me.
before I boarded the plane back to Singapore, I realized there were three people in my life that really needed to know that I made this transition before I can go out and announce it to everyone else. The first was my wife, because she's only ever known Nemo. I called her and I shared with her. And she ended the, the call with, I love you, Niyama. Hearts, just, yes. What a woman. What a partner. And then I called my mom. I'm, I, I'm sitting in, I'm eating a yogurt next to me, trying to eat healthy. Uh, and I'm calling my mom. It's like nine o'clock in the morning, West Coast time, mid, uh, noon time. Uh, on the East Coast where she was. And she was at work. And we were talking and I let her know. I said, hey, mom, I'm about to enter this, get on this plane, but I need you to know that like the time of my life where Nemo was there, it's now behind me. Now going forth as Niyama. And my mom is just awesome. She was so gracious. She was like, all right, that sounds good. And there wasn't a big hullabaloo. It wasn't like this major celebration where she's like, thank goodness you're back. No, it wasn't any of that. It was just acceptance. We had just a really powerful conversation with each other. One that was more open, more honest than I've had with her, I think, in my life. And she was just, I'm so grateful for you, mom. Like you were just so fully present in the middle of the workday. You're just like, whatever you need right now, I'm here. I got you. And then it was, it is a part of this story, part of how I know this is the way to go. I called my dad shortly thereafter. I didn't have as much time to talk to him. I had to call him after, uh, after I finished all of this. But I had to let him know as well. His name is not Nemo. It is Niyama. Honestly, it feels like the Lion King. It's like at some point Rafiki's like, nope, wrong again, you know? And I've returned. I've returned. I'm seeing if there's anything else I need to share with you in order to be complete in the sharing of this particular story. Niyama has been reborn. Niyama stands before you. And it feels great. It feels great. So I'm going to end this here. Feel free to leave any comments, anything that you want to, to share. Um, this feels, I feel lighter in the sharing of this here. I feel more complete and just, just fully in it. I'm going to spend the next few hours going through all my social media, uh, going through my website, changing it. I've already bought the domain of niyama.com and niyamashong.com. So you're going to see all that. This is complete. This is full. <sighs> because for the work that I'm doing, for the work that I'm doing, I need to be the person who is modeling that it is possible. And doing it as Niyama Ashang, where there's no way to hide that I am not part of the system, will create the space that's necessary, or create even more space for you and anyone else like you to know that you too can claim your place as you are in the contribution, in the history, and the creation of this world. I thank you for being here and being witness to my story. I thank you for being part of the overall pool magnetism of, of the universe that can call out something like this. I can have me shift myself in one hour of something I have been building up to for my entire life. Life, death, and rebirth. I'm here. I'm sharing my story. I'm owning all of my story and all of who I am.
and you will hear me share stories going forward because that is the truth of it all. My story is powerful. My story is mine. And my story is getting out there. I share this because I want to hear your story. And I want you to know that your story, whatever it is in your life, whoever you are in your life, whatever you go by in your life, you are important and your story matters. Your name matters. Your name matters. Even to the point of allowing, of not allowing them to mispronounce it. It's, there's beauty and power in who you are. I'm finding that right now. And I love and I honor all of you for taking the time to witness me as I really go through my journey and use that to now go forth and answer the question, what am I gonna do with it? I'd love to see your comments. I'd love to see any questions you have for me. I'm playing this playing this all the way through. Like the, the momentum needs to come in, the energy needs to come in. I really need to make this shift. So like not even make it, but I need to really own the shift that I've made. So you'll see, I'll probably do some asking energy, any things or create other places where other ex experiences where people can share their stories and just be heard and to be witnessed and to be seen as they truly are. I am Niyama Shang and I am. Be more you because you are a gift to your world. I'll talk to you soon.